If you enjoy this content, please take a moment to rate and review it. Your feedback will greatly impact our ability to reach more people. Thank you. Hello. Uh, it's just me today, Marcus. Um, Vic is out once again, leaving me here. And uh, I was just too busy to book a guest host. So uh, you just got me. But um, I'm going to run you through the stories of the week because we got a job to do here. We got to keep you posted on what's going on in the world of health innovation, the economy, AI, payers, providers, pharma, the whole deal. And uh, what a week it was. You know, I was talking to Aaron, our producer, and we were doing our normal kind of, you know, review of production. What can we do better? And he was like, dude, did you remember what last week's show's title was? And it was, um, you know, could the could the AI bubble uh, tank the U.S. economy. So kind of funny leading into this week, uh, how everything kicked off the week on Monday. Uh, but before we go too much further, uh, I'll just say that we've gotten some really good feedback on um, the stories we're, we're putting in on AI. I think a lot of people are getting a lot of value out of that because um, AI has got is a really noisy space. And so uh, we are committed to continuing to do that. So thanks for that feedback. And, and we will continue to move on with that. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and dig in. So I want to start just by talking about Monday's uh, fiasco of a day. I remember coming in on Monday morning, sitting down with Vic for our 9 a.m. like we do every Monday. And he started basically telling me he was listening to uh, our friends at Hedgeye. They do a, a, something called the call every morning for members of Hedgeye. Um, and so he was listening to the call and kind of giving me the Hedgeye take, and um, which which is always really, really good. Um, and I was like, I hear that. I'm just telling you, I have no idea what's going on. And I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure anybody has a great idea of what's going on because, uh, when we went to sleep on Friday, we had no idea, you know, we were going to go into a weekend coming on Monday and see the VIX go up to 65. You know, the last time that the VIX even got remotely close to that, or I should say exceeded 65, um, was during the pandemic. Right. So and, the, and for those who are not uh, clued in, the VIX is is shorthand for the CBOE volatility index. Um, and that is basically the index that says, like, how scared is Wall Street? Right. How much volatility uh, is there in, in, in the economy? And how does the stock market, how does Wall Street view that that volatility? So um, generally speaking, uh, if the if the VIX goes above 30, that's like a pause. Don't do anything. Um, don't sell because it may not be the bottom yet. And it doesn't go over 30 very often. Um, and just so you know, re like recently, it's been below 20 for, for, for quite a while here in 2024. Um, it shot up one day from below 20 to over 65, spent the majority of Monday and Tuesday over 30, and then has uh, come back down now it's back below 30 again. It's in the it's in the 20s. I think it's around 27 right now um, at the time of this recording. So um, crazy, crazy day. I spent a lot of the day watching CNBC, just hearing the pundits and hearing what they were talking about. Um, but I, I do have to say, whether it's the, the carry trade on the Nikkei or whether it was the jobs report, <clears throat> the one thing that was really clear was there was a heavy, heavy sell-off of the Magnificent Seven. Um, and I, I do think that the pressure around being um, economically productive assets and the scrutiny around the R&D spend that, that came with this earnings report season uh, had to be a major factor in what happened on Monday. And now that we are on the other side of it, things are mostly okay. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's, what happened in the most recent jobs report from this week. Um, I don't think it's too soon to say that some of what occurred on Monday was a correction, right? Um, there's a lot of talk right now about Powell and the Fed and whether or not they're going to do um, an interest rate cut. Uh, there's a story in the New York Times that came out today that I think very uh, astutely surmises what we are all sort of wondering is, did the Fed wait too long? Are they going to get to their soft landing or are we... Um, did we go too far and did we push this whole machine over the edge into a recession? I will say that as I pulled together stories for the week, 
um, there were not a lot of bright spots. Um, you know, a lot of what is going on out there reflects what I feel like I've been telling my portfolio companies for the last year. And even today in a board meeting, I was reiterating again, um, this is not a grow at all cost economy. Uh, this is a you better be able to show that you're profitable and I want to see your balance sheet economy. And um, I don't care what the promise of the future is. Uh, we want to know what you're delivering today. That's that's kind of where we are. And it's interesting. It, it kind of feels like there has been um, a decade plus of investing in the future. And everyone is just kind of like, OK, we're tired of that. We want to see the, the rewards get reaped. Um, there's not been a lot of uh, feedback from the Fed. You know, I, when I was watching CNBC, I saw the folks from the Chicago Fed talking. So obviously, you know, the, the different outposts, but not a lot from the FOMC. And um, I think that's good. I, I'm really glad we didn't hear from them on Monday. Um, people were banging the table, calling them for them to make an emergency rate cut. Uh, I'm really glad that they just stayed quiet, let this thing play out, um, because here we are Thursday when I'm recording. Um, the stock market has bumped. Uh, the, the Dow has jumped six, more than 600 points. Uh, there were some really good uh, earnings reports from from uh, organizations like Eli Lilly um, that that were uh, saying they're, they're going to revise guidance up. So that's really great. Uh, the the Nasdaq did did a really good job in rebounding. So basically, we are I don't know a slight correction from where we were last week. But I think the question that has really set in based on last week's jobs number and the the overall sense that we we have hit a real soft point with the consumer the the credit card delinquencies are rising the credit card balances are rising the consumer discretionary spending is decreasing travel especially domestic is decreasing all of these trends feel like we're at the point where we're knocking at the door of a recession uh, and some people who have their different formulas and rubrics would say we are in a recession. So I, I hope that that's not the case. I hope that we are right up against the wall of it and that in September we do get that rate cut. I, I do think that for uh, everybody to to be able to calm down, we're going to need a rate cut at this point because there's just too much sense of tightness and the economy moving in the, in the wrong direction. And we're getting to that point where the bearishness is starting to feel more like uh, m more like a, a depression. And I don't mean a, like a great depression. I mean, people are genuinely depressed about the state of the economy. Um, and that's not where we want people in America feeling about the economy. So my, my sense is, especially after this week's activity and the threat that it posed, we are I think we're really likely to see a, a rate cut in, in September. So that's my bet on it. Uh, nothing, nothing more to say there. I just, I'm just going to stick with, I think on, in September, we're going to see a rate cut. Uh, okay. So moving over to venture capital. So there, there weren't a whole lot of great rounds this week, but I did want to flag that over the last uh, week, there have been two 500 million plus funds in the life sciences space. And I think one of the reasons why that's so interesting is when I start to run down things that are happening in pharma, uh, it really is a feast of famine life cycle right now. We've talked in the past, and when I had Emily on, uh, we talked about how NIH funding is decreasing. There's a ton of pressure there. That is shrinking the pipeline of new innovation that can make it through the regulatory uh, uh, gauntlet. And that obviously means less innovation, less opportunity for breakthrough, less opportunity for return on the massive amounts of co capital that have to go into life science investment. So I thought it was really interesting that Two life science funds from pretty big names in the space. One, Venn Bio, they raised $528 million uh, for a life science fund. This, this would be their fifth fund. And uh, the last fund that they raised was in 2021. So they raised a $550 million fund in 2021. That was like the, the high point of the, the private market 
activity, funds being raised. So it makes sense that they raised $550 million then. But then they came back in 2024 in a time where not a lot of people are matching what they did in 2021, and they raised $528 million. Now, who knows how long they've been raising that fund, but really impressive for them to get that out the gate. And it'll, it's, it's certainly a great sign for the life sciences community that this fund is now in market making investments. And also TPG, big name in the space, uh, they have raised $580 million uh, for their life sciences fund. And so, you know, th these are these are big names. These are these are big dollars. They're not billion dollar funds, but uh, certainly more than five hundred million dollars for two funds in a week in the life sciences space is a really big deal. So I did want to highlight that because I haven't seen a lot of that activity going on. I know that biotech has been really in trouble ever since uh, COVID hit. Um, it's it's the, the capital has really, really dried up. And that has made it really hard for deals to get done. A lot of people have walked away from biotech. I know for for funds that we're contemplating in the future, it's really sort of low on the priority list. So it is great to see fund managers who are specializing in having success with the LP environment, being able to raise these funds. So that's really, really good. Congratulations to both VenBio and to TPG uh, for bringing more capital into the market. Uh, moving into policy, one real big story I want to cover this week is that CMS announced that they are going to start to find ways to cover cutting-edge medical devices with Medicare. This is a big deal. Um, I, I think I've talked in, in several episodes about the different experiences I've had over the last year with my dad and his experiences with the healthcare uh, system. And one of the things I think I was le I've been least impressed with is the tech enablement that is available for seniors. Uh, the, you know, Medicare, in terms of what they do covering uh, hospital stays, it's fantastic. Um, if you've got, especially if you've got secondary insurance, it's unbelievable. I mean, it, the, the, the coverage is fantastic. And what it does in terms of getting you into specialists and all those kinds of things, really, really good. But we start talking about devices, and you start talking about giving access to the latest technology, it really is lacking in that space. And so it is, I think it's a great development that CMS has finally been developing this for a long time. And they finally announced that they are going to temporarily cover select medical devices uh, from the time that the FDA grants them with market authorization. And it's looking like this is going to be sort of a five year pilot that they're going to put in place, which is nice because it puts it in place where it's going to kind of go past the first term of whoever is the next administration. So that's really great. Um, it's, it's just nice to see real innovation coming into Medicare and not just more more dollars moving into the same old types of service models. So. That's real exciting. Uh, Scott Whitaker, who's the CEO of a device trade group, AdvaMed, uh, both celebrated it as a step towards stronger, more robust policy, but also acknowledged that it doesn't go far enough, basically saying it's the first step, but you know the, the device trade industry is, is seeking more and more um, uh, support inside of CMS, more and more resources inside of CMS uh, to support more support for payment models that will bring devices to uh, to seniors. So uh, I think it's a positive move and excited to see what devices are going to be part of the first wave that are going to be rolled out and going to be supported. Uh, in the payer space, two stories that are both tied to Medicare Advantage. The first one is Centene. We've talked in the last couple of weeks about the really strong results that both Centene and Molina have had. These are uh, payers that have really focused on the Medicaid part of the business and, and focused on that and really been knocking it out of the park. Centene is going to exit six Medicare Advantage markets, and they're exiting pretty small markets for them. It's, we're talking about a total of only 37,000 Medicare Advantage enrollees between all of these uh, of these markets that they're going to leave. So this is only 3% of their Medicare Advantage membership. They are focusing on stacking their Medicare Advantage membership in states where they have really strong Medicaid presence. So I think that makes sense uh, where they can really focus on dual eligible programs that they can run. Uh, and also programs where they've just got more uh, stronger network, more scale in place. Uh, but what I found was really interesting is they are going to keep their Medicare Part D prescription, prescription drug plans. And that shows that the changes that have been rolled out in Medicare Advantage um, really are about the drug plans. They're really about the drug plans and the star ratings and the lower rates. And so we know that the the star ratings, uh, there was a loss in court around that. And so that's that's pretty much be re, been rewound. Uh, but 
not the rates. The rates are still sort of where they are. And I think we're going to see more and more payers just saying we have to optimize for the markets where we have scale and where we can stack services uh, in a way where it gives us an advantage on the margin side of the business. So Centene uh, continuing to look like a really smart operator uh, in the Medicare and Medicaid space, exiting small markets where they don't have any real business playing and, and optimizing for the markets where they can be uh, best of breed, especially with their dual eligible book of business. Uh, the second one, this was announced yesterday, and this was a big one. Uh, CVS, they slashed profit guidance. Uh, the CEO of the Aetna Business Unit uh, has been uh, has been let go, uh, Brian Kane. He only was at, at the top of, uh, of Aetna for a year, I understand. And so he's, he's now gone. Uh, Karen Lynch and the CFO, Thomas Cowley, they are directly coming in to oversee the Aetna business. Um, they're, they're downgrading uh, their, their adjusted earnings um, and, and the guidance. So it's, it's just huge, huge problems around the Medicare Advantage uh, business this year still showing up. I, I think Vic and I thought that because of the court case, that was going to be a, a, a change. And because there was going to be, uh, you know, an increase in premiums, which we saw humanity right away, that these businesses were going to be able to figure their way out of it. But uh, it's looking like for CVS, at least, uh, this is this is a, a, a big problem. So um, we, we're going to need to watch this one more closely because obviously CVS has drugstores. Um, we we know that the drugstore business is a very challenged business, whether we're talking about the pharmacy side, whether we're talking about bad leases, whether we're talking about your ability to actually profitably operate um, uh, clinics inside of these these businesses. But this, but the focus here was about the insurance business. And a little bit of me wonders, we hadn't heard a whole lot from Aetna uh, over the course of the last 18 months around where they were focusing their their insurance business. You know, we saw Cigna say, we're going to take a strong focus on the consumer. We're going to shuttle all of our CMS business. And that's really sort of paid off for them. United has tremendous scale and they're, they, they've they been the first out of the um, the gate with the payvider model. And so their data advantage, their services advantage, the fact that they employ the most physicians in the country, that's given them, I think, the scale and the breadth to be able to perform uh, better across the entire array of different markets of insurance. Uh, but we've been talking about Centene and Molina and how how well they're performing when it comes to uh, CMS products. But Edna, we hadn't really heard a whole lot about, like, what changes are they making? And, and it seems to me that could be part of what's going on here, that they just were not fast enough to respond to the changes that were happening uh, at CMS and, and saying, hey, where are we going to focus uh, our book of business? And it could be that that's what's what's really going on here. So I don't think this is going to be the last big change we're going to see out of out of CVS. Then we need to watch them very closely, because if Karen Lynch is actually stepping in to take over the Aetna business, I would imagine there's going to be some really big changes coming pretty soon. Uh those will look like business unit uh, shutdowns. Those will look like layoffs. Those will look like cost cutting measures. Those may look like uh, you know real focus on the on the care mark business. Um, so I think we we need to watch CVS because I think there's going to be a lot of changes happening over the course of the next six to twelve months. Uh, Walgreens. So we know Walgreens has had a CEO change. Tim Wentworth uh, came in uh, last October, and he has been sort of consistently making changes at, at corporate, lowering sort of the, the the overhead of some of the highest paid employees of the company. But now a big announcement that came out yesterday is that Walgreens is considering selling the entire Village MD stake. So that's a total turnaround from the position over the course of the last four years. Uh, Walgreens made a $1 billion investment in Village MD in 2020. And then they invested $5.2 billion uh, in late 2021, taking a majority stake. I remember when they did that, um, really going all in and saying, hey, this Village MD is going to be our platform for urgent care. Um, they expanded into multi-specialty uh, when, they, when they acquired Summit Health City MD. But now they're looking at just boat anchoring, boat anchoring the whole thing. And I think, again, this just gets to this um, – this soberness that is hitting the market where people are saying, listen, this is not we're not in a growth market. We're not in a, a consortium market. We're not in a, a conglomerate market. We are in a 
show me what you do exceptionally well, improve it in your PL, improve it in a really, really robust balance sheet. And that's all anybody wants to see. And nobody wants to see people being distracted right now because there's just a feeling that capital is not going to flow to overly ambitious, distracted organizations. And so I think Tim Wentworth was brought in to do just this. And uh, this is a big deal. This is a big deal because if they sell the Village MD stake, I mean, where does Village MD go? Walgreens is already talking about shutting down something like 25% of their storefronts. Um, we already know Rite Aid is totally out of out of play. Where does Village MD go? Uh, Kroger's already got a platform. You know, there's there's no more big real estate platforms for a Village MD to go to. And uh, Wentworth cited the reason why he's looking at potentially selling it is because of the cash needs of the business, which to me says that the business is not healthy. Uh, this looks and smells a lot like Walmart deciding they were just out entirely. We're just getting out of the clinic business, shutting the whole thing down. So again, major shifts. This has been, I don't know, it feels like a 15 year process of integrating uh, primary and urgent care into retail um, storefronts. And it does seem like it's, it is largely getting walked back. Um, today, what we mostly st see still working, I know here, here in Nashville, there's um, partnerships between uh, you know, Walgreens and Vanderbilt, where they're sort of operating a lot of the clinics. And that makes a lot of sense because Walgreens has the storefront, they've got the traffic. Vanderbilt already runs a pretty robust urgent care business. And um, you know that, that kind of makes sense. But does it make sense for grocers to actually be in the business? Does it make sense for drugstores to actually be in the primary care, urgent care business? Um, you know, we, we saw Walmart decide, hey, instead of running our own clinics, we're just going to partner with Humana. This, they, their, their target audience matches our target audience. So we're just going to put this in a well um, clinic brand in our footprint and we'll work out the economics on the back end and call it a day. And it feels like we may be seeing more of this. Who knows? This, this could be something that CVS ends up, you know, taking a hard look at. So just really, really interesting trends happening in the space where people are making hard decisions uh, in the interest of the health of the business and not trying to sell a, a story of growth because there's just not growth capital out there, not even for the biggest names. All right, moving into pharma. So I think the big story for this week, and thank you, Emily, for the for the hat tip on this, Charles River Labs, um, they had met earnings and actually exceeded uh, uh, analyst expectations quarter after quarter uh, for quite some time. But this quarter, uh, they came out and they they said, hey, the outlook actually looks pretty bleak because we don't see a great pipeline uh, of, of new activity coming through. And that's what Charles River Labs you know, really does is they support the pipeline of innovation coming through. Again, this is why I said I was so interested to see two new VC funds each at half a billion dollars coming online because it seems like the research for you know drug development is currently struggling. You know that that entire pipeline and the capital that drives that that whole pipeline is sort of struggling. And so Charles Rivers, uh, Charles R Charles River Laboratories stock tumbled twelve point six percent on on their announcements, and uh, you know just just kind of a it feels like there is a there's there's going to be a consolidation in the pharma biotech space. Um, you know, the lilies of the world seem to have an exceptional handle on how they're how they're navigating this. We think about, you know, who were the darlings of um, of all things pharma during COVID, and you know, if you look at what Pfizer was doing, and now look at them, and it's it's just a really tough situation for anyone where their primary book of business was trying to you know focus on vaccines. Um, the, the chronic disease states um, seem to really be uh, a winner, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in, in a little bit with hymns. Um, so, so the GLP ones obviously sort of a strong space, but I think are going to be challenged based on demand, what the true sense of the demand is, and also different players coming in uh, who who have really really strong marketing uh, capabilities and can meet consumer demand uh, for something that is a is a true. Uh, national crisis, uh, which is obesity. Charles River Labs been beating their they've been beating their um, expected results quarter after quarter this month, fi finally saying, hey, 
we're not seeing the pipeline come through. We're not seeing the pipeline come through. So I think this is uh, it's it, it's going to be an interesting space to to try to measure up because I still think there are going to be a pipeline of drugs that are going to win. I think some players are going to going to really make it, but this is going to affect academic re- uh, uh, research centers. You know, this is going to impact. It, it, there, there's so many players in this space, in this ecosystem, in this bio ecosystem that um, if the pipeline does shut down, I mean, think about all the CROs, think about all the clinical trial players, um, all of that just kind of gets compressed. And I can tell you firsthand, like we, we've we've got companies in our portfolio who have been signaling to us for a year and a half now that the clinical trial space is getting really, really choppy. That water is getting really, really choppy. Um, they were seeing clinical trials that you know looked really robust, and then they got put on hold, and no one sort of understood why they got got put on hold. So definitely uh, a, a, a space to watch. And and if you're if you're long on this space, I think you got to look at the folks who are who are winning and saying what are the what are the the traits of a Novo Nordisk of a Lily, uh, you know, versus some of the others that may not be doing as well. Fierce Healthcare uh, published today the Fierce Biotech layoff tracker for 2024. Um, And I couldn't believe the number of layoffs that have happened just so far this year. Uh, And they said last year they tallied 187 total layoffs. And that's not lost jobs. That's layoffs. Um, In 2022, it was 119. So it had jumped 57% year over year. Uh, And this year, I mean, the the layoff count is pretty strong. There's, you know, kind of 20 per month, uh, maybe in in this list here, all included in the show notes. Uh, But a lot of layoffs, folks, a lot of layoffs are happening in the biotech space. A lot of slimming is happening. And this is the kind of industry where these jobs are highly specialized, right? These are very, very highly specialized, skilled workers. Where do these folks get their jobs back? I was talking to um, uh, a new college graduate who is finishing up an intern, getting ready to move back to Nashville and about to take her first job at a startup. And I, I just said, listen, um, be really scrappy, be really scrappy, be really hardworking and be willing to do uh, whatever and have have no no rich expectations. You know, this this is not quite like graduating during the, the, the great financial crisis, um, but it's feeling like it's not that far away from it. And I do think work ethic and an ability to to adapt to what's happening in the market is gonna be really, really important because I feel for these people who spent decades of their life dedicating to to being excellent in, in these specific spaces and between capital pressures, you know, governmental pressures, and then the the rise of computer science and, and artificial intelligence and how that is going to uh, replace labor. Some of these jobs, I think, are just going to be lost for good. And you think about, well, how are you going to reskill people who are already highly skilled and specialized? I don't think that's a simple, easy thing to do. Um, so the biotech space is a space that just really concerns me, I have to say. All right, talking about him and hers. So last week, Vic and I talked about how the FDA issued an alert talking about the Overdoses that were happening in the GLP-1 space, specifically focusing on compounding uh, GLP-1 organizations and talking about how the dosing is, you know, specialized, quote unquote specialized, but also with that um, may not exactly be right and can easily lead to overdose. You don't have that kind of specialized dosing coming from uh, the zip bounds and the uh, and and the 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 Novo Nordisk product. Ozempic. Uh, so that's that's sort of an advantage that the compounders can produce. Um, they can create a microdose version for you. You know, that's not something you can get with the big brands. Um, but with that comes a lot less uh, consistency, probably a lot less testing and potentially, you know, more overdoses. So there was some pressure coming from the FDA. There may be also just pressure coming from uh, the big brands that have invested big in this and saying, hey, you know, maybe we don't want uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry coming into the market and, and just selling the same thing that we have invested so heavily in. Uh, well, Hims came out and said, 
we're not stopping it. In fact, we're looking at you know buying a U.S. based compounding facility that's registered with the FDA. Uh, and and on that news, their their stock pumped. So I, I think the point that Vic made last week is is probably the right one, um, which is. The FDA is really the only entity in America that can take real meaningful action against a HIMSS, for example. Um, HIMSS is going to be very uh, favorable to the consumer. And so, you know, it's not going to be a popular thing for a government agency to take away a, um, a, a, a provider to the consumer that the consumer really likes. Uh, Hims is great at marketing, great at engagement. You, you can see them all over, you know, Instagram, Facebook. So they're they're up on the latest technologies, and they're a publicly traded company, and they don't have a track record of you know being a being a pill mill that that gets people overdose. And so I think they feel like they are doing this the right way. They've got the scale. They certainly have the the um, the, the ability to to fight a legal battle. Um, and they probably have the consumer on their side. They probably have the the, the will of the public on their side, uh, selling something that there is a demand for at a lower cost and in and more specialized dosing. Just sounds like a winning value proposition to me. So I think it's going to be interesting to see whether or not the FDA takes that next step of action. You know, do they do more than an alert? Will there be an actual enforcement action that comes out? And if it does come out, are they going to actually target hims or are they going to look for Lower brow, you know, under the table, not as buttoned up, not publicly traded companies that are kind of easy to squash, maybe continuing to send shots in the direction of a hems, but not actually taking them on. Uh, in the meantime, you know, as long as they've got the window to do this, uh, and as long as they believe that there is demand, I think Hims sees this as an opportunity to gain market share um, and to capture market share. And so they feel that it's a race. And I think. You know, their their top line and their bottom line probably says this is really meaningful for the company. And while a lot of people have thought about it as, uh, you know, it's it's an emergency exception where they're getting the ability to do this. I think their view is once we get a certain scale in the market and we have a certain base of consumers, are you really going to tell the American consumer you need to switch back to the engaging in the healthcare system that you basically hate instead of this beautiful app telehealth experience that feels like Amazon. And I think for most people, you know, the answer is going to be that's not going to be a politically friendly thing to do and what administration wants to set up their, their uh, you know, their regulatory agencies to do that. Um, I think we're already learning a lesson based on what's happened with the SEC and Gary Gensler with the crypto uh, industry that you, you don't want to do something that is not consumer friendly. Right. Um, if you want to win elections and if you want to, you know, keep a, a favorability rating and if you don't want to uh, piss off a contingent that could potentially, you know, raise a huge pack against you. So well, I think we're learning a lot in this election season that's going to stick for at least the next 12 to 18 months. And that probably benefits him. So uh, interesting story there. Wrapping up with AI. So our good friend uh, Rick Abramson, who did a guest episode with us, uh, he shared on that show a lot about how radiology was really tip of the spear when it comes to a lot of new technologies, AI being no different. Uh, he had just finished up a run uh, as, I believe, the chief medical officer, but I may have that wrong, uh, of a company called Annalise AI that's based in Australia. And so I found from, from him sharing about it uh, on LinkedIn uh, that Annalise uh, recently announced that they have uh, secured Medicare new technology add-on payment uh, from CMS for, um, for, for their technology, specifically focused on obstructive uh, uh, hydrocephalus. And so really impressive um, that, that an AI company based in Australia has been able to get a new payment from CMS. Uh, radiology does have a track record of being a space where technology can be tested, proven out, and and get that get that next payment. But this is a this is a big deal. This is not like using AI to lower the cost of um, you know doing revenue cycle management. This is not like using AI to be uh, a scribe so that doctors can focus on their patients and they don't have to be you know typing into a computer. This is literally using AI and getting paid for it, new money. Um, so that's that's a big deal. So Annalise.ai, I'm gonna 
put the link for uh, to the LinkedIn story in the sh- in the show notes. Definitely look at this. I think it's a big deal that this company was not based in the United States, but was able to get the first uh, Medicare advanced uh, add on payment for AI in 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 this radiology area here in the United States. You know, Rick was talking about how difficult it is to to advance. AI here in, in the United States and how that was one of the things they were focused on was doing things in the UK and other markets where they had a more straightforward path because the FDA is kind of the regulatory body here and um, they're they're regulating AI like a medical device and they just need to update everything. But the fact that they've been figured out how to get an, an, an add-on payment is a really big deal. So this could be the beginning of many, many more. I, I, I know they're the first, but I have a hard time believing they're going to be the only for very long. So I think we do need to look at more and more AI innovation that now starts to seek getting add-on payments from Medicare. All right, and then final story on the AI front is OpenAI. OpenAI had a bang-up week this week. Um, John Schulman, who was one of their co-founders, left the company and went to rival Anthropic. Um, He said he wanted to deepen his focus on AI alignment. I mean, if that's not a shot at OpenAI, saying that they're reckless at, op- at AI alignment, I don't know. Um, and he wants to start a new chapter where he can return to hands-on technical work. Maybe he's saying he's been doing too much red tape and too much politicking over at OpenAI. And also maybe he's not al- because he is not aligned with the direction that OpenAI is going in, he's not allowed to do hands-on work there. Um, so he's moving to Anthropic. And this, this move from a co-founder of OpenAI really sort of signals that maybe Anthropic is is the more morally oriented of the AI companies here. Uh, so that's a big statement. In the same week, Open OpenAI's other co-founder and president, Greg Brockman, is taking a sabbatical through the end of the year, he said in the next post this week. Um, you know, the only is the I think the only co-founder who who is left is Sam Altman, right? Um, Ilya Sutskever left in May. John Schulman leaves this week. Greg Brockman goes on sabbatical for the rest of the year. It's August 8th, my friends. I think Sam Altman's the only one left. So there's a lot of stuff going on at OpenAI. Um, and I think people are really going to start taking a much closer look after this week at what is going on at OpenAI. Um, for those who don't know about Sam Altman and some of his other uh, initiatives, you might wanna look up WorldCoin. Uh, it's a much lesser known project that Sam Altman has, but it is in the crypto space and it has a lot to do with scanning irises and creating a, a world ID for everybody. So think about like clear, but clear plus crypto um, and not in the hands of anything that's regulated heavily by a government. Um, you know, OpenAI is now talking about using all sorts of personal information. And I think there was a lot of issues that John Schulman may have taken with that. So we're going to have to fo- focus on on what OpenAI is doing now, I think officially, because all of the co-founders have left. Um, and the only one that's left is Sam Altman. And, and clearly some, something is, is very, very wrong there. Um, I don't want to draw a direct analogy to um, Meta and what happened when all of Facebook's co-founders left and only Mark Zuckerberg was left. But uh, I don't know. Maybe it's not that different. So we're going to have to really, really watch this company. Sam Altman is very, very smart. Um, but if you look at the orientation for what he likes to build and the way he talks about things. He talks in very ends justify the means language. And I think that that is always something that requires scrutiny uh, when we're dealing with our our information, which to me in a digital age is a big part of our, our, our freedom and our autonomy. So uh, that's the last story for the week. I told you I wasn't going to take too much of your time, uh, but I did want to make sure I gave you – you know, a good rundown of what's happened in this super crazy week. Uh, and it has been super crazy. Um, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for sticking in with me. I kept it under 40 minutes next week. Vic will be back. We will uh, be back at doing what we we always do. Also heads up 
two weeks from now, we're going to release a guest episode with uh, Tarun Kapoor, who is um, the Chief uh, Digital Transformation Officer at Virtua Health. We're going to have a, a catch up with him about everything with Wobot um, and also other things they're doing with AI. We haven't talked to him in six months, and he's fascinating, brilliant, super smart guy. So I can't wait to uh, hear what he's been up to over at Virtua Health and just what he thinks about the way that AI has been evolving. Um, a lot has happened in the space. We've had several organizations in the healthcare AI space sort of pop up since our last discussion. So a lot to hear from from Tarun. So some good shows queued up for the next couple of weeks, and I can't wait to share them with you. And until then, my friends, I'll see you.